geologists have been looking at the Earth in a scientific way for about 200 years now. And especially after we have now landed on the moon and begun to explore it, and after spacecraft have orbited other planets, Venus, and now even landed on Mars, many geologists have begun to wonder just how the Earth compares with other planets in our solar system, and perhaps even with planets in other solar systems, if there, if there are any. The film you've just seen, The Cosmic Connection, gives some indication of the connections in the history of the planets in our solar system. But it didn't give very many answers, and the reason for that is that we just don't have very many answers at the moment. It's still very much speculation. Uh, nevertheless, after three months of looking at the Earth in this course, I think it is worthwhile speculating a little and trying to put the Earth in perspective as far as we know it. Getting back, if you like, from the trees and having a look at the forest. For a thousand years, astronomers followed the dogma which held that the Earth was at the center of the heavens. But in 1543, the Polish astronomer Copernicus published his conclusion that the Earth and other planets were in fact in orbit around the Sun. He was supported by other astronomers, including Galileo, who was one of the first to work with a telescope in the early 17th century. A space vehicle traveling at 18,000 miles per hour would take 46 years to cross our solar system. And even light traveling at 186,000 miles per second would take 11 hours. But seen in perspective, our solar system is simply one of a hundred billion within the galaxy we call the Milky Way. And here the dimensions of space become almost impossible to grasp. Distances are so tremendous that even the speed of light seems slow. To cross the Milky Way, it takes light 100,000 years. And our galaxy is but one of uncounted millions of other galaxies in the known universe. With radio telescopes, we can detect galaxies so far away that it would take like 26 billion years to reach us. Galaxies, not planets or even suns, are the main units of the universe. And they've been studied extensively by astronomers ever since they were recognized for what they were. And recently, some effort has been put into computer studies of hypothetical galaxies in an attempt to understand how real galaxies develop and behave. Data on the size of and rotation of any number of stars up to a million can be fed into computers. From the data, the computer constructs a variety of artificial galaxies, speeding up the real rotation of once in a few hundred million years to a matter of seconds. A comparison with real galaxies can be used to judge the success of the computer. If you look up at the night sky, many of the so-called stars that you can see are in fact galaxies, great swirling clusters of stars. And if you were to go to the Mount Palomar telescope, the largest telescope on Earth, you would be able to see about two billion galaxies. The light from the farthest one having left there about four and a half billion years ago, just at the time that the Earth was formed. Now, despite their appearances, uh, appearance as great clusters of stars, galaxies are in fact mostly space. If you were to take our own solar system and uh, convert it to the size of a dime, a quick calculation will show that the nearest star would be about 200 feet away, and between them would just be space. The powerhouses of solar systems and of galaxies, and in fact of the universe, are the suns.
Our sun, like other stars, is an immense sphere of hot hydrogen gas about 865,000 miles in diameter. It contains over 99% of all the material in our solar system. The temperature in the center probably reaches 10 million degrees. The surface, at about 6,000 degrees, constantly surges into immense prominences and flares, reaching thousands of miles into space. The Earth on this scale would be about the size of the tiny dot at the center of the screen. The prominences are made up of electrically charged gases, which carry an electric current and become trapped in the sun's magnetic field, often cascading back into the surface in a spectacular fashion. The violent surface activity releases bursts of electrified atomic particles, which reinforce the general outward flow of particles from the sun called the solar wind. This gas-like wind bombards the planets and distorts the magnetic field of those which have one. A bow wave even builds up in front of the magnetic field, which acts as a shield. The same solar wind causes the tail of comets to shine by energizing the gases in the tail. At the same time, it drives the tail away from the sun. This is Halley's Comet, photographed in 1910. When the atomic particles of the solar wind arrive in the vicinity of the Earth, traveling at 700 miles per second, one of the most spectacular results are auroral displays. The atomic particles stream in at the magnetic poles, and they collide with the molecules of gas in our own atmosphere. The pattern of the lines of magnetic force of the magnetic field are best seen in the coronal type of auroral display. But you shouldn't think that the solar wind is only reaching the Earth when we see auroral displays. If you were able at any instant to take a cubic centimeter of the Earth's atmosphere, and a cubic centimeter is about a sugar cube size, you would find in it approximately 10 atomic particles of the solar wind, mostly protons and electrons. And that solar wind and those particles are a reflection of the thermonuclear processes which are going on inside the sun and which keep it hot. The sun is not burning material in the same way as we burn material on Earth. It's keeping hot and supplying us with energy through a process which converts hydrogen.